height. Not going to be in today, uh, so I thought we'd um, get use the time to make sure that uh, we can crack on with uh, some of the radiation stuff. I'm going to be uh, looking at uh, nu nuclear fission. Um, so I'm putting together lots of little um, videos, so um, it should all fit together, but uh, uh, I, I, I might start off um, like I just started the video in the middle of the video, but that's just because I'm editing it around, so, so don't worry about that. But this is, this is the beginning for you guys. So when, um, when we talk about nuclear fission, this is the definition of nuclear fission. I'm just going to go through that so that you can uh, hear me say it and you can hopefully visualize it. So we've got a large uh, nucleus um, and usually these large nuclei that we're dealing with are usually uranium or plutonium. We're going to, we're going to use uranium to start off with. So we've got this large nucleus of uranium and it absorbs a neutron. And absorbing that neutron, it becomes extremely unstable, um, so unstable that it can no longer maintain its size and it's more energy efficient for it to split apart into two smaller, more stable nuclei. It will also release two or three neutrons, sort of depends, and it will also release some energy, which is how we generate nuclear bombs and nuclear energy like from this energy that's released. Okay, so we've got a nucleus, it's a large nucleus, it doesn't happen to everything, Uranium does fission, and then it absorbs a neutron, becomes really unstable, splits apart, produces two neutrons, sometimes three neutrons, but it always produces um, some energy. So I'm going to do a little diagram of one fission reaction. So here we've got our neutron, and here we've got our large and stable nucleus. So it will actually absorb into the uh, this large and stable nucleus, but it become really unstable and it and this energy is released and as well as, as that energy we get um, another neutron in this case two neutrons and what will also happen is we'll get two smaller more stable nuclei that uh, if it was a nuclear power station it would be radioactive waste so they um, are radioactive and also these neutrons are quite nasty as well they've got lots of kinetic energy and if they uh, were to be absorbed by something they would do quite a lot of damage as well so this is um, a single fission reaction but and you, and you do need to be able to draw this um, so let me just make sure that you understand that that's the the energy released okay and that's let's call it uranium so we've got neutron going to uranium energy is released we get two neutrons have come out and also radioactive waste now in a chain reaction um, this is something that needs to happen in a nuclear bomb and a controlled chain reaction needs to happen in a nuclear power plant and you need to be able to draw this so we're going to start off with our neutrons. So all the neutrons are going to be, um, actually I'm going, to, I'm going to start off and give myself a little bit more space. There's, there's the uh, neutron down here. And that's going to go into my uranium. It's going to turn that uranium into a different form of uranium, a different isotope of uranium. And it's going to fission. And one of my neutrons is going to go up there, so that's one neutron. I'm just going to do two neutrons because otherwise it just gets too busy in this space here. And also it produces these two smaller, more stable um, isotopes that are um, radioactive. But these two neutrons are then absorbed by two more uranium nuclei. And they each undergo fission so this this explosion here is my way of trying to say that there's energy released this one then goes off and produces two neutrons and also two more stable smaller uh, nuclei radioactive waste and this one also goes off to produce 
two neutrons, there's my two neutrons, and also two smaller. And then the process just keeps going. So we've got, I'm not going to do it because you can see very quickly that I have run out of space. Um, but that's enough for your chain reaction diagram. But what you can see is that from one neutron, we get this amount of energy that comes out. Um, but because that uranium splitting apart produces two neutrons, those two neutrons cause two more um, energies to be released. So we've straight away doubled the amount of energy. And then you can imagine up here, this one's going to produce energy, this one will produce energy, that one will produce energy, that one will produce energy, and you'll have eight more um, neutrons produced here. So the number of neutrons goes from two to four to eight in this example. It could go three to nine to 27, for example. But the thing is, it's um, exponentially increasing. It's, it's doubling regularly or tripling regularly. You get this very rapid increase in neutrons and energy being released. And if we don't control it, um, it's a nuclear bomb. And the difference between a nuclear bomb and a, uh, a nuclear power station is uh, the nuclear uh, station controls how many neutrons are flying around, which we will talk about in a moment. But that's what um, a chain reaction is, and that's what nuclear fission is, and some energy. So we're just going to go over that in a little bit more detail. So what, what we're going to start off with, we're going to say that um, uranium-235 um, is going to be our um, nucleus that we're going to fire a neutron at. Okay, So we're going to add a neutron to uranium-235. And for a very brief moment, it becomes uranium-236. So it's an isotope. Of uranium 235 and this is very very unstable the uranium 235 um, you can just dig it up out of the ground it, it, it doesn't do anything it doesn't it doesn't fission or blow up or do anything nuclear explosion -y, if you like until it absorbs a neutron um, so we've got to manufacture artificially add a neutron to it. it doesn't happen naturally and it becomes uranium 236 and this is where the fission takes place so what's going to happen is that it's, in this occasion, and it's a little bit random what happens, but the most common one is that it forms an isotope of barium and uh, an isotope of krypton. And we're going to choose these isotopes, 141, and barium's always 56, but it's going to be the 141 isotope, and krypton's always 36. Now you do not need to memorize this. I'm going to emphasize to you today what it is that you have to do. Um, and what you have to do is you have to work out how many neutrons in this space here in this box. We need to put a number in there to say how many neutrons are produced. And we are going to do this. Uh, so in, in an exam, you, you would be given, let's say, that information there. Um, the only thing that you are expected to do from that apart from explain what fission is, so it's the splitting apart of a large and stable nucleus when it absorbs a neutron into two smaller ones and some uh, two or three neutrons and also some energy. But you have to be able to work out various numbers for this. In this occasion, we're going to work out this number. So the way to do that is uh, to look here. We've got 236 and 92. That's the start of our um, equation here. We can pretty much ignore what's happened to the to the left of that. This is this is what is producing our fissionable material. So it's this bit. So we've got 236 and 92. So if we just add up 56 and 36, use my calculator to show you this. We've got 56 plus um, 36, and we can see that's 92. So we can see that 56 plus 36 equals 92. And if we look at new, uh, the neutrons in terms of our nuclear equation. It's, uh, this bottom number is zero, which means it's not a proton. And what this number here means that it's a nucleon. It's either a proton or a neutron, but it must be a proton. So it can't be a, new a proton because this number here is zero. So this number is one. So let's work out what 141 and 92 is. 
141 plus 92. So it's 233. So if we compare 233 to 236, um, so uh, 236 minus that, we're three short. This number on top is three short. So that should be a three. But it can't be a three because neutrons are three. So that means that this must be a three here. There are three neutrons produced. So now if we add this up, 141 plus 92, instead of that three, we could say there's a neutron and another neutron and another neutron, and we get 236 from that. But in total, it's like having three neutrons. So the next question is, why does this release energy? And the reason why this releases energy is quite complicated, but I think quite, quite simple. If we were to look at the mass of this and add up all the masses of these, these are a bit, and I say a bit, it's almost unnoticeable lighter than uranium-236. Okay, so we've got some mass that is different. So there's what we call a mass deficit or a mass difference. I'm just going to call the mass difference M for the moment. And that is converted into energy. And the cool bit is by using Einstein's equation E, energy, is mass, the difference in mass, times the speed of light squared. And that's where we get the energy from. So we end up having something here, and then it splits up. Poof, goes into all of these things, but on a very, very small level, the sum of all of these masses is ever so slightly lighter than that. And we and to conserve mass and energy, that little bit of mass that is different, that's seemingly lost here, is transferred into energy, and that's where all the thermal energy comes from. All right, so let's have a look at uh, a different example so you can um, think about this. So here we've got, I've, I've not done the um, uranium-235 absorbing a neutron bit here. Um, that has happened, but I'm just making it a little bit simpler. So we've produced this uranium-236 by firing a neutron at the uranium-235 nucleus. The uranium-235 nucleus has absorbed that neutron to become uranium-236, and this is really unstable. This will fission. And on this occasion, it's going to fission again into barium and krypton. But notice that I'm, I'm going to say this time that it's going to produce two neutrons. And um, this time, uh, we're producing a different isotope of krypton. Last time, it was um, uh, 92. Um, the, the, uh, the mass number was 92. Um, and the atomic number is still the same, it's 36. And for barium, the atomic number still got to be 56 because all barium is 56 and all krypton is 36 and all uranium is 92. That's what makes what they are. But on this occasion, what we're going to do is we're going to try and work out um, how many nucleons are. So we're trying to work out what this number is going to be here. So again, like an exam question, this is the information that you will get. You're supposed to know what's happened here to make uranium-236. Uranium-235 has absorbed a neutron. You're supposed to know what's happening over here. It's fissioning, splitting into two um, smaller, more stable nuclei. Um, on this occasion, barium and krypton. And on this occasion, two neutrons. And also, there's going to be some energy released, which is important because that's how nuclear bombs are produced and also how nuclear energy is produced. So it's the same thing again that we did last time. It's, it's really, really just basic uh, basic maths. We've got to make sure the bottom number adds up 
and also the top number. So the bottom number over here is uh, 92. So let's just make sure that that adds up. 56 plus 36 equals 92. So the bottom number, the atomic number, if you like, has been conserved. So 0 plus 36 plus 56 is still 92. The same must happen for the top number. Now over here, there are two neutrons. So it's like putting plus 1 naught plus 1 naught n. That's, instead of doing that, we just put a 2 there. That's what's happening here. So we've got um, two nucleons there, plus the 90 of krypton. So we've got a, no, a total of 92, but it should be 236. So I'm going to do 236 minus 92, and it says 140, so 144. So I've got 144 as the number of nucleons. That will give the, the answer for, for that. And, and in terms of fission, that's all you're, that you're supposed, supposed to know, is that how to balance those nuclear equations, making sure that either side of the arrow, of the, um, the reaction arrow, is that 236 is equal to 144 plus 90 plus two of those ones. And on the bottom, this 92 is equal to 56 plus 36 plus 0. Okay, so the next thing that uh, we're going to look at is the nuclear reactor. So don't worry about drawing this because there's a nuclear reactor booklet um, that I will put onto this page so you can just refer to this. So um, it's similar to it, but I try to simplify it for my uh, own drawing purposes. So we've got a couple of things on this nuclear reactor. We've got um, what's uh, essentially on this side, which is the reactor on, he on here. So this is the whole reactor. And over here we have something called a heat exchanger. And um, that's what that's called there. So I'm just going to go through exactly what happens um, and emphasize the points that you really do need to know about. So um, first of all, there are fuel rods. And the fuel rods are in these, they're about hockey puck sized and then they're just layered on top of each other. And um, when, when, it's, when all the fuels diminish, those fuel rods are taken out and that's radioactive waste from the nuclear fission reaction. Um, so the fuel rods um, are usually uranium or plutonium. That's, that's the fuel. Um, when, then we've got uh, control rods and these um, are often made out of a material called boron so they're very very dense and the control rods, what I tried to show there, the control rods uh, can be lowered in or removed out of the spaces in between the fuel rods. And the purpose of the control rods is to control the number of neutrons. So if you remember back to this diagram, what the fuel rods will do, it will absorb this neutron. And then all of these reactions down here won't occur. So you'll only have this reaction taking place. So you've controlled the chain reaction. You still need a neutron to sustain the further fission reactions, but you're controlling how many fission reactions take place so that you don't get over um, a, a massive release of energy in one go. Um, if this occurred, that would be uh, a meltdown or nuclear explosion or a nuclear bomb, if you like. So that's what control rods do. They absorb all but one of the neutrons. There's got to be at least one neutron. So if there were three neutrons in this reaction, it would absorb two of them. So on average, they absorb all but one of the neutrons. Um, so in our reactor, the most important things, though, there's two most important things, the, the fuel and the control rods. Without the control rods, essentially, we've got a nuclear bomb. So this is going to get very hot because of the energy. And what we have in this space here is, um, sorry, can't spell, 
a coolant. Um, you know, it's either a gas or a liquid, depending on the uh, design. And what will happen is all of this area here will be hot gas. And that hot gas or hot liquid will come over here. And the heat exchanger, which has water in it, this very, very hot coolant that comes in here will um, make the water very, very hot. So hot, it will turn to steam. And the steam then comes out, uh, which goes to a turbine, which goes to a generator. more about turbines and generators later, but from that point onwards, that's how the electricity is generated. Now, that steam, when it goes off out of here, when it goes onto to the turbine, it cools down and it turns into cold water. So the cold water comes back in here and there's a little bit of a nice cycle of water going on here. And once all of this coolant has transferred its energy, this is why it's called a heat exchange, it exchanges the heat from the coolant to the water so it can turn into steam then also this coolant um, then becomes cold and we have cold coolant co coolant coolant going uh, back in well we've got hot coolant at the top because it's less dense going in so we have this um, process of a nuclear reaction taking place here fission reactions taking place uh, transferring energy to the coolant, hot coolant goes over here, in the heat exchanger, water's heated up, water turns to steam, steam turns to turbine, cold water comes back in, and that cycle is completed, and the cold coolant is pumped back in here to heat up again, and the process starts all over again. So that's a basic uh, generator in there. Now there's one other thing that we need to talk about, and that's um, that's this material here that I'm shading in now. So this material here is called a moderator. And the moderator is made out of graphite. And it's the moderator's job to slow down the neutrons. Because uh, what you want is, you want this to happen, you want a neutron to be absorbed by, um, sorry, wrong one, two, let's try again, 235.92 uranium. You want this neutron to be absorbed by this uranium. If this is too fast, it will just go past and escape it. It's a little about you, you trying to catch a ball. Um, if the ball's thrown at you too quickly, you might not catch it. But if it's slowed down uh, a little bit, you're more likely to catch it. So the, the job of the moderator is when all these neutrons are flying around here, the moderator just slows those neutrons down a little bit so that the uranium is more likely to capture them so that you're going to get fission reactions taking place. Remember that the control rods are moved in and out to control the number of reactions. Uh, to control the number of neutrons that are being produced and uh, the fuel rods, obviously uranium. So to just make sure that you understand the material and the roles of those important parts of the nuclear reactor, uh, remember that the fuel rods, uh, they contain the nuclear fuel and that's uranium or plutonium. Um, after the process of fission reactions, um, the fuel gets depleted or runs out and in its place uh, you end up having nuclear waste. And uh, the next thing is control rods. These are made out of boron and the job of the control rods is to absorb all but one of the neutrons produced in a fission reaction and we can control the number of fission reactions um, and therefore the amount of energy being produced by moving them either further in or taking them out of the reactor. Obviously, if you move them in, you're absorbing more neutrons and therefore 
less power is produced. And if you take them out, you're absorbing fewer neutrons and therefore you will have less energy. So uh, the nuclear power station manager can use the control rods to generate either more electricity or less electricity by moving the control rods in and out of the nuclear reactor. And then we have the moderator surrounding all of the uh, fuel rods. Um, a common um, material for that is graphite. Sometimes it's water. It, it, it varies on the design, but it's a, a kind of graphite is a common one. Um, and that is used to slow down the neutrons so that those neutrons are more likely to be captured by a uranium nuclei. Um, think of the analogy of someone throwing a very, very fast ball at you and whether you're likely to catch it or not. And that you catching it is the equivalent to a neutron absorbing, um, being absorbed by uh, uranium nuclei. So slowing them down makes the reactions more likely because you want the reactions to occur but you just don't want them to occur uncontrollably. Uh, some of the pros and cons uh, that you need to know about uh, are listed here, so we're just going to go through those for you to finish off nuclear uh, fission. Um, and because it's a nuclear reaction and nothing is burnt, we don't have any greenhouse gases being produced, for example carbon dioxide, so the impact on global warming is significantly reduced compared to coal, oil and gas. Obviously there's no sulfur dioxide produced, so there's no acid rain either. Um, and uh, a huge benefit is also that it's extremely high energy density. Um, so if you're not sure about what that term means, it's sort of like thinking how much energy do you get out for a kilogram? compared to coal, oil and gas, you get far more energy for every kilogram of um, uranium or, or plutonium than, than coal, oil or gas. We just call that a high energy density. And also it's extremely reliable. Uh, it just runs all the time and uh, produces a consistent amount of uh, energy. So it's a very good um, fuel, if you like, uh, choice for generating uh, electricity, uh, particularly when we're worried about greenhouse gases, mostly because of the reliability, um, because obviously we want, we would prefer to have renewables, um, but of course the massive issue with renewables is that they're not very reliable, sun doesn't always shine, it's not always windy, waves, tides, things like that, it's just not reliable enough. Um, huge list uh, Compar comparatively um, of, of negatives though. Uh, they're extremely expensive uh, to build um, and they take a great deal of time to build um, and for that reason um, governments don't really like them that way. You should realize there's a double M in commission and uh, they're also expensive to decommission. Now Decommission means after 30 odd years of using the nuclear power station, uh, when it's no longer safe to use, uh, you need to take it apart and deal with all the radioactive material that's there and return the site to its former uh, glory and safe life. So you, know, you could buy, you could build then a, a school playing ground um, there without them worrying about nuclear um, radiation or anything. So very, very expensive to build. Um, then they do all of these positive things when you build them. But after that, there's this huge cost on trying to restore the, the site back to its former glory. And of course, um, there's radioactive waste as well, which is radioactive for extreme amounts of time. And you've got to do something about that. You've got to store it somewhere. And um, once you've someone's at the front door. I think someone's at the front door. I'm just going to ignore them for the moment. Hello, mate. Hiya. That's for Mark, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye, See you later. Um, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> 
before I got rudely interrupted. Um, yes, so radioactive waste uh, needs to be dealt with, and that radioactive waste is, go is going to need to be stored somewhere, um, and it's going to be stored there for thousands of years, perhaps. And it might get into um, the food supply or water supply, and it could contaminate things in the future. So that, that's a very, very expensive thing to do as well. And um, that leads to expensive security measures where you've got uranium and plutonium. Um, terrorists might want to get hold of it, so you've got to make sure that they're secure and the terrorists can't get, get hold of them. And then when, where you store the radioactive waste, unfortunately, terrorists want to get hold of the radioactive waste as well, so you've got to make sure that they're um, stored securely um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a secret place that nobody really knows where they are. And, and technically, of course, uh, nuclear fuel is non-renewable because uh, we have to dig it out of the ground to use it. Uh, once we've used it, it's gone. So the last thing that we're going to look at in this topic is nuclear fusion which is the process that generates all of our energy that comes from the sun. And if we look at it, um, we can sort of see that it's uh, pretty much the complete opposite to nuclear fission, where nuclear fission is the splitting apart of a heavy unstable nucleus um, to produce energy. This is the joining together, um, hence the term fusion. So if we're going to define it, we would say two light nuclei joining together, close enough to join together to form a heavier nuclei, and in this process um, it releases energy. So a common um, thing to happen in the sun is that we have a um, hydrogen nuclei. In this case we've got uh, an isotope of hydrogen uh, where it's got um, a proton in the nucleus, but this means it's got a proton and a neutron. Um, technical term for this is deuterium. Um, so, but it's still hydrogen because it's got only got one proton. And if it gets close enough to another deuterium, um, another hydrogen uh, isotope, then it's going to form helium. And you can tell that because uh, if we add up the mass numbers and the atomic numbers, we get 2 plus 2, which is 4, 1 plus 1 is 2. And in the sun, hydrogen is turning into helium and it's releasing energy. And it's releasing energy because uh, ever so slightly, this helium is ever so slightly than these two. So there is a difference in mass. As helium is lighter than the masses of these. The mass that appears to be sort of lost or not present is actually converted into energy again. And it's that same equation. So the mass that we appear to be have lost in this multiplied by the speed of light squared is converted into this energy that we're seeing around us. It's not a lot of energy per, per nuclei reaction like that, or per fission reaction, but per kilogram it's very, very significant. Um, and if we were to look at that as a sort of diagram, here we've got uh, a proton and attached to it is a neutron, so that's our um, hydrogen nuclei. And um, we can see from this that it's uh, positively charged. So it's got a charge of uh, plus one. And what needs to happen is that that needs to move towards another hydrogen isotope. And this has also got a charge of plus one. So under normal circumstances, um, they wouldn't reach each other. Uh, so at room temperature, they repel as, oops, like charges repel.
power. So how do we get nuclear fusion to occur? So it only happens when the pressure is high enough so the particles are really, really close together. And the temperature is high enough. And with a high enough temperature, therefore, the kinetic energy is large enough. So you're, you're getting them very, very close together for a high pressure and you're making them move a lot faster and have a lot more kinetic energy. So to do that, you need a high temperature. And if you've got those, therefore, they can overcome this repelling force and fuse together. Um, and that's really the most common question at GCSE is, what, what issues are there with nuclear fusion? Um, and the issues are that you have to um, have them at very, very high pressure and high temperature. So people are saying, well, we can start making um, electricity from nuclear fusion, but you've got to get hydrogen, because it's already done, lots of hydrogen around, but you've got to heat it up to a very high temperature and have it at a high pressure and that's very, very difficult to do. Now, the very last bit is to look at the pros and cons of fusion. And I don't mean in the sun, I mean using fusion on Earth to generate electricity like we use fission on Earth to generate electricity. Um, so in terms of um, the, the positive, the advantages of this, um, it, it uses hydrogen, and there's lots of hydrogen around. We've got it attached to uh, water, and we can remove that. And we could um, even go into space and get more hydrogen. So uh, it's not going to be like using uh, uranium, where we have to dig it up and dump uh, a small amount of it on the Earth. Uh, the universe has got lots and lots of hydrogen. Um, it's also got a uh, high energy density, and what I mean by that is there's a great deal of energy being produced for every kilogram available. And in fact, its uh, energy density is greater than um, fission, so it's, it's very good uh, for that. And it's much, much larger than the amount of energy per kilogram that comes out of coal, oil, and gas. Um, just like fission, uh, it doesn't burn anything, so it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide. So the impact on the environment is much less from a, a perspective of global warming. There's no um, sulfur dioxide being produced either, so there's no acid rain. Um, and unlike nuclear fission, um, the, the, the product from this is, is, uh, is helium, uh, which is not a nuclear waste, not radioactive. We don't, we don't need to worry about storage and um, security with, with the waste products. In terms of uh, the disadvantages, uh, as you'd expect, very expensive to build. Um, just like nuclear fission, it's uh, expensive to decommission. You have to, after 30 years of use, it needs to be taken down and um, uh, the material needs to be removed and needs to be done uh, safely and uh, so everything is restored to its original um, uh, safety measures and, and uh, the environment isn't impacted at all very very expensive to do that um, and to do this it needs a high temperature and a pressure remember the high temperature and pressure are required to overcome the electrostatic repulsion because what you're trying to do is make something that's positively charged a hydrogen nucleus um, fuse to another hydrogen nucleus both of them positively, positively charged and want to repel so you need to get them closer together therefore high pressure and you need them to move about very quickly have high kinetic energy because you need to have a high temperature and to do that on earth that's going to require a lot of energy in the first place so you need to put a lot of energy in 
to get energy out. Um, so that's that's a, a tricky process there. Um, and in some cases, and we didn't, I didn't do the nuclear reaction that produces neutrons, but some of the fusion reactions produce high energy neutrons. And what they will do is that they will get absorbed by the building around them, the, the, the shielding around the nuclear reactor, and that then will become radioactive. So the building itself and the shielding around the nuclear power plant will become radioactive. So when it's decommissioned, uh, that will need to be looked at as well. So there, it is uh, you know massive potential to um, to take on our needs for. Oh, I guess I should put here that once you get it going, it's I guess there's a reliable amount of energy that comes out once you've got it going, but it's really difficult to get it going because it needs a massive amount of um, temperature and pressure. And I guess we could also put. Um, it's safer than fission. And what I mean by that, if a nuclear reactor, a fission reactor, goes wrong, there's usually a nuclear explosion, such as you might have heard about Chernobyl and Fukushima. But um, if the fusion reactor goes wrong, it just shuts down. So um, it's much, much safer from, from that perspective. Uh, and that's radioactivity done.